grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may be seated. The text is the Gospel, reading from St. Matthew that we just heard. We've lived here just about a year now. It's been just a week over a year since we moved to Hickory. And in the year that we've been here, we've had a chance to get out a couple of times to the Blue Ridge Parkway, and we've noticed uh, that there are uh, signs there that say scenic pullover. And we've learned that that means that the view is a beautiful one and that it's unobstructed. I think we used to call them Kodak spots, but nobody knows what Kodak is anymore. The signs all say that you really should pull over and catch this view. As we traveled through the season of Christmas, we stopped at several pullovers in order to witness and view our Lord's humanity, born of the Virgin Mary. During the season of Epiphany, we've made several pullovers to view the unobstructed view of our Lord in all of his divinity. And now today, on this Transfiguration Sunday, we come to the pullover where we see our Lord and his divinity shining through an unparalleled glory. The fullness of his divinity is shining right before our ears. The transfiguration of our Lord then is the grand finale to the season of Epiphany. If we haven't yet beheld what St. Paul describes as the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, well then, today, you're in for a beautiful view. Like Peter, James, and John, we do wish we could stay here forever. And in fact, in fact, one day, one day, we will. In fact, this is the view of Jesus that the church triumphant in heaven has all of the time. And it never gets old, and it's never time for them to move on. But for we who still live in the church militant, the transfiguration of our Lord is just a brief stop on the journey as we make our way from the season of Epiphany into the season of pre-Lent and then Lent and then ultimately the cross where the God-man, Jesus, will completely, completely set aside his glory. And the view will be only that of humiliation, pain, darkness, suffering, and death. And so today it is extremely important for us to hold on to this view, this view of his unparalleled glory that our Lord is being, that is being held before our eyes and ears today, lest when Good Friday comes, we fail to recognize just who it is who is hanging there on that cross and dying for you and for me. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and he became white as light. This is nothing else but a fulfillment of Jesus' own words. He once declared, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John, who was there on the mountain on that day, would later report in his revelation that the heavenly Jerusalem has no need of a sun or moon to shine on it because the glory of God gives it its light and the lamp is the Lamb. The light of the world and the lamp of heaven was shining brightly for Peter, James, and John to see. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. This is a beautiful view for us to take in. As Jesus leads these three disciples up from below. Moses and Elijah come down from above. And the saints below and the saints above meet together in Jesus. 
It happened on the holy mountain there, just as it does at this holy altar here. When the angels and the archangels and all of the company of heaven from above meet together with the saints from below in the body and the blood of Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Frankly, I don't know that there is any greater understatement in all of the scriptures but this. It is good for us to be here. This is what the saints in heaven say in word and song unending, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tents here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter didn't want this experience to end. And if we had been there, neither would we have wanted it to end. For one day, it will come time, and it won't end. It won't end at all, but for now, it must. Life down below, here in this world, in this struggle, life does not always follow the scenic route. In fact, our life in this world is mostly a journey from one disappointment to another with an occasional seas, uh, scenic overlook along the way. And the devil, the devil wants you to believe that this is all that there is. That there is nothing better for you to hope for. That there is nothing more for you to wait for. That there is nothing left to persevere for. To re no reason to endure. No reason for you to keep on believing. But here today, we are given a glimpse of Easter and the joy that awaits the faithful who will share in the victory of our Lord over sin, death, and that devil. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Ah, Peter said, let us pitch three tents right here and stay. In the Old Testament, as the people of Israel made their journey to the promised land through the wilderness, they would put up a tent for God to live in at the end of each day's travel. And the glory of God was present in the tent. When God's servant Moses went into the tent, he stood in the presence of God himself. And when he came out of the tent, his face shone so brightly that he had to put a cover over his face, a veil over his face, in order to prevent all Israel from running in fear. He had to put on a mask, no doubt a KN95. Now in these last days, the glory of God is still located in a tent. Jesus Christ is the skin tent in which God is present with us and where God himself can be found in all of his glory. John was recalling the transfiguration when he wrote the familiar words, and the word became flesh and tented among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. Now in these last days, we enter into that holy tent of Jesus' very body through holy baptism and through the Lord's Supper. And then we go out into the world, just like Moses with face shining, the glory of God brilliant in us. We want all the world to see it. Let your light so shine so that others may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Whatever it was that Peter was thinking by his offer of building three tents, the Father in heaven cuts him off in mid-sentence while he was still speaking. Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. The time for talking will come. But for now, it is time to listen to him. 
the reaction that these three disciples of Jesus have to the voice from the cloud is both strange and remarkable. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. In the presence of Moses and Elijah and the transfigured Lord Jesus with his face shining like the sun, they seemed perfectly relaxed. They wanted to hang out with the group. Let us build three tents. Let's stay around. Let's enjoy the moment. But now as the cloud overshadows them and the voice from the cloud declares what is most true, this is my son with whom I am well pleased, they were terrified. When Moses heard the voice of God that came from the burning bush, we read, he was terrified and he hid his face. When Elijah stood on the cleft of the mountain and God passed by him, Elijah was terrified and he covered his face. But now these two Old Testament heroes hear the voice of God from the overshadowing cloud and they are at perfect peace with God. Why is this? Why is this that Moses and Elijah are at perfect peace with God in the hearing of his voice and the three disciples of Jesus are terrified? It is because Moses and Elijah know who Jesus is. They know why Jesus has come and the work that he is to do. But these three men still do not know this. At least they do not know it yet. This friends, is what our life before God the Father looks like apart from God the Son. Apart from God the Son and the knowledge that he has come into the world not to destroy us, not to hurt us, or to harm us, but to save us. There is only sheer terror before the presence of God. Only through the Son who has atoned for our sin and made us righteous before God, and who invites us to call upon God the Father as dear children, call upon their dear Father. Only through this Son of God do we have peace with God. No sooner do these three sinners fall on their face in terror than we read, but Jesus came and touched them, saying, rise and have no fear. In Jesus, we have peace with God. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. No radiant face, no Moses and Elijah, no bright cloud, no voice from the cloud, Jesus only. And it's like that for us too. No visions, no voices, no miracles, no signs and wonders. Jesus only. And we are to listen to him. When he says, I forgive you all of your sins, Listen to him. When he says, peace I give to you, my peace I give to you, listen to him. When he says, take and eat, take and drink, this is my body, this is my blood given and shed for you, for the remission of all of your sins, listen to him. He could have just left them remain there in their fear. He could have commanded them to follow him and obey him in their fear. He could have given them his great commission to go to all nations in their fear. This is the way every other Lord works, but not this Lord. 
He is the good shepherd who goes before his beloved sheep. He doesn't send them into the valley of the shadow of death. He leads them through it by going in front, even to the point of dying first, even dying by a cross, all so that they might know that even death, even death itself is nothing to fear for the little lambs of Jesus. Jesus came and touched them and said, rise and have no fear. The same Jesus came and touched you in your baptism. And he keeps touching you over and over and over again in this Lord's Supper. And the message for us each time he touches us is the same as it was for them. Have no fear. I know that sometimes, sometimes because we are who we are, that's just not enough for us. We might want something more substantial, more real to base our faith on. A miracle, a vision, a sign. Uh, we'll take a transfiguration anytime. But the truth is, it is enough. We don't need to see what they saw. It's enough for us that they saw it. Peter writes, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We believe their word because the truth of the matter is when we listen to the apostle's word, we are listening to Jesus. The fact that they saw what they saw then is enough for us. Because the day is coming when our Lord will come again in all of his glory, the same glory that he displayed on the Mount of Transfiguration, and every eye will see him, not just Peter, James, and John, but every eye will see him, yours, mine, everyone. But until then, until then, Peter recommends, you will do well to pay attention to the word as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. For that very brief time, these three disciples experienced what it means to live by sight and not by faith. They saw the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. They saw Jesus just like Moses and Elijah and all of the company of heaven see Jesus right now. But for us, the glory of God in Jesus is all covered up, all hidden from our eyes, at least for now. And all that we see is what we're given to see. The crown of thorns, the blood, the sweat, the nails. All that we are given to hear is what we can hear with our ears, the screams of pain, the eye thirst that knows no relief, the agony of drawing even a breath, the last tormented cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And no voice from the cloud, and no touch, and no comforting word saying, rise and have no fear. Here is what we are given to see. Here is what we are given to hear. And I don't know about you, but for me, quite frankly, it's not the sight of his glory that moves me so much as it is the sight of him hanging from the cross for me, for you. On the cross I see neither his glory nor his power, but I see in unmistakable clarity and beauty his love for me. And this is the view that compels me to listen to him. Amen.